is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ring, but holy trust in Jesus.
Amen. Good morning. Anybody thankful for our musical worship here at Hendersonville and Gallatin as well? Amen. We thank the Lord for leading us every week. Uh, if you're here with us this morning, we're continuing through our series called Legendary. We're talking about, in a sense, superheroes of the Bible. And uh, today we're going to talk about the one who probably is the closest to a real superhero. We're going to talk about the life of Samson. And I specifically want to talk about how not to wreck your life, okay? Anybody want to learn how to not wreck their life, okay? Okay, seven of us. Okay, uh, for the rest of us, this may help, uh, hopefully, in the future. Uh, but we all have a, a, a kind of a fascination, I think, with, with superheroes, right? We all want extraordinary strength. At least, at least I did. Um, when I was a boy, I, I used to think I can fly. Anybody with me? Like, when I was really little... I used, to, I used to think I could fly. Like, I, I wanna, I'd wanna fly, and I would think, why, why can't I be Superman, right? Like, why can't I be Spider-Man? And so I would go in the backyard, I would climb the trees, I would get on the roof of the home, and I would attempt to jump, like, really, like, I'm gonna go for it. Anybody tried to jump off a roof before thinking, okay, I'm not the only, <laughs> right? And then I'd get in trouble, like I'd always do, for climbing the tree and getting on the roof again, and so I'd be punished uh, but I think one of the reasons we love to think about superheroes, the reason we like Avengers, uh, the reason we watch Justice League is because w we all want to be that way, right? And I think when you think about the Bible, you think about superheroes like Samson. We think about people with extraordinary strength, people used by God to do an amazing thing. So what we're going to see this morning is this. Here's a man who has all the talent, all the ability, the hand of God, the spirit of God, and he disregards his calling and never actually fulfills the potential that he has in life because he misuses the power and misappropriates the power God has given him. I wanna show us this morning how to fulfill the calling God has in our own life and simply how not to wreck our lives. Anybody wanna learn about that? We're gonna learn about it from a case study of Samson. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Judges. The book of Judges, and if you're there, you can say a word. Now, we're going to try to cover four chapters in 35, 40, 42 minutes. Okay, so no, it's going to be about 37, but here's the point. Uh, don't get too nervous. It's going to be a lot, but I want to give you some, some overarching themes and then some application points. So let's jump into chapter four, 14, sorry, verse 3. Sorry, chapter 13, verse 3. Just checking. Um, when you're there, say word. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, it is true that you are unable to conceive and have no children. Or is it true? But you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now please be careful not to drink wine or beer or to eat anything unclean. For indeed, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You must never cut his hair because the boy will be a Nazarite to God from birth and he will begin to save Israel from the power of the Philistines. Then the woman went and told her husband, a man of God has come to me. He looked like the awe-inspiring angel of God. I didn't ask him where he came from and he didn't tell me his name. He said to me, you will conceive and give birth to a son Therefore, do not drink wine or beer and do not eat anything unclean because the boy will be a Nazarite to God from birth until the day of his death. Let's pray as we begin this morning. Father, we pray that you would speak to us personally and individually about the calling you have on our life. And God, we know the greatest thing we can do is, is to obey and please you. And so, we pray this morning that you'd speak to us now. I know in a group this size, there are some at different stages of their life, some who are sold out to Jesus, some who don't know Jesus at all, and a lot of people in between. And so we pray that you would help us to take the next step, whatever that is, in our spiritual journey. We love you, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. All right, three, three uh, things, three, three actions Samson takes that we want to learn from. Number one is this. Samson disrespected his parents. He disrespected his parents. So let me give you kind of the backstory here. 
Uh, his mom is barren. It reminds us from some of the women of the Old Testament. So you see this picture of Hannah, you see the picture of Sarah, so you see some of that. And so she's barren, and the angel of the Lord comes um, multiple times in this text. I think it's four times in, in this one account. Uh, it may be more, but it's at least four times in this account. The angel of the Lord comes and says, you know, you're gonna have a son, this is what's gonna happen. And so a Nazarite vow was something where you set yourself apart. Now, men normally took this, some women could take it as well, but the Nazarite vow was a commitment to set yourself apart in three areas, write this down. Number one is this, you would abstain from beer or wine, and basically anything from the grapevine. So you wouldn't go around vineyards, you wouldn't touch grapes, you wouldn't be around the, the, the plant, you just would stay away from that. And that was just a picture that God was protecting. He protects in order to prevent, that's how God works. The second thing we see is that this person would not cut his hair. So the original dreadlocks back here, who knew, right? Back in the Old, Old Testament. And the third thing was they would avoid touching anything dead. Okay, so you wouldn't touch a dead animal and you wouldn't touch or come in contact with anything unclean. So this is a high agreement, but in a sense, it set this person apart. And what we're gonna see is Samson is about to disobey God in most of these areas right out the get-go. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Samson. His name means in Hebrew, guess what? And this is important. His name means son, S-O-N, sorry, S-U-N, minus S-U-N, but it could be a picture of the sun, but S-U-N, sun, but it also means brightness, or it also means, uh, it can also mean shining, okay? Now that's important, because we're gonna see he doesn't shine very much in his life. He disobeys his parents in a couple of ways. Number one is this, uh, go with me to chapter 14, and I'll show you what he's about to do. Uh, Samson starts to connect with a woman who is a Philistine. Uh, why were Philistine women off limits to Jewish men? just in general, forget Samson, in general. Why, why is that the case? Because they were not from the nation. God was protecting the people from the pagan gods of the nations out here, and so he said, don't intermarry. Why? Because you're gonna get connected and infiltrated by the false gods. But Samson's hard-headed, and so he does it anyway. And so he goes out on his own, and we see in chapter 14, verse six, Samson's gonna come in contact with a lion. He's gonna kill this lion, but it says he does not tell his parents. Do you see it? They won't tell dad what happened, and there's a reason for that. Then we see, we drop down to verse nine. Verse nine, we see that he comes back and he sees this dead carcass. There's a swarm of bees with a, with a bee's nest, and the bees have produced honey, and what does he do? Look at the text. He scoops his hand in the honey, and he eats from the lion's carcass. Why is that a problem? because he's not supposed to touch anything dead. So his father now comes on the scene. He's like, well, what is going on here? So verse 10, we see dad comes on the scene and Samson throws dad a party. You know, dad's in town, let's blow it out. And look what the text says. His father went to visit the woman and Samson prepared a what? Underline it. What does your version say? Feast. Anybody say anything other than feast? It's a feast, okay, so it's a feast. But that word feast is an interesting word. It's not just the word party or get together or hangout. The word feast is actually the picture of a wine gathering. So this is a drunken party with endless wine. I mean, why not? Dad's in town, we're gonna come to the frat house, we're gonna blow it out for dad, right? Dad's here. And the problem with Samson is this, he has already blown it in a number of different areas where God says, here's the standard and you have blown. Here's what you're gonna see about the life of Samson. He's always at the wrong place, at the wrong time, doing the wrong things. Um, does anybody in here have a master's degree in backseat driving? Anybody? <laughs> if you're not raising your hand, you know who you are, right? I mean, my parents are the worst of this. I love, I love you, mom and dad, but they are, and I think the older my parents get, the worse they are at this, right? You ever call your parents? I mean, my parents are just figuring out how to talk on the phone in their car, but they can never get it working right. You have parents like this, like, hold on, let's get it connected. Call me back, son. It's like, okay, it's gonna connect. So we finally get connected. And I try at times, and I refuse to do it now, but I try to talk to them while they're driving. And it doesn't matter who's driving, mom or dad, the other one is going to navigate from the passenger seat, right? She's like, how's your day? Hug, slow down, watch this guy. 
Like, oh, yeah, we're doing great, Mom. How y'all doing? Hey, he's late. He's switching lanes on you. Watch him. I'm watching him. Stop. I'm like, like this is all gone. Anybody's parents like this? All gone on. And it always ends like this. I'm never riding with him again. I'm like, Mom, you've been married over 50 years. This ain't going to change. You know, like, like, you think this is going to change. It's not going to change. So I refuse to talk to my parents. And they probably refuse to talk to me because I, I mean, you know this. I'm not the best driver. I admit that. Anybody admit they're not good drivers? And it's not that I'm not a good driver, I'm just an impatient driver because I learned in New Orleans. And so we, dr we drive hitting the horn, like everything is with the horn. In fact, one guy taught me this technique, this is unsolicited advice right here, where you, I used to drive with my hand on the wheel and my forearm would hit the, would hit the horn. Like you didn't even need to move, like some guy cut you off, you just hit the horn on him. You know, bam, bam. <laughs> didn't have to move your hand. And it looked really conspicuous because they didn't know who's bumping the horn. I'm just driving, you know, <laughs> And so that's what you do. So, so and, and the problem with me is I like to like cut people off with the love of Christ, of course, right? So we're driving with our staff last week and we're late coming back to the office. We were downtown and one of the staff guys is in here. And, and we see like this police, like the, like the long line on Vietnam vets, which normally in the case. And, and so I see this long line, but we have to get to the office. And so I'm like, I know what I'll do. This is another pro tip. Don't try this at home, by the way. But if I see a policeman stopped in the left lane, merging people in the right lane, I realize that if you drive up to the policeman, they have to let you in, just for the record, right? Because they feel convicted, like, who's this moron? Oh, that's our pastor, right? So we <laughs> let him in. So I was flying like I normally do in the lane, and I'm about to just cut in this lane, and my staff member says, don't dare cut this guy off. He says, don't cut this guy. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's got a long hollow sticker on the back of it. Okay, so, and I have a personalized plate, so that was not gonna be a good thing. My driving so bad, one time I was with Candy. Now, in my defense, New Orleans is a difficult place to drive. Okay, don't you agree? Every street is one way the other way. So Royal, Bourbon, Chapatula, they, they go one way this way, one way this way. And I forget which way is which, right? So one day I'm driving on the wrong way, right? And I don't realize it right away. And Candy, you know, she likes to drive and help me drive from the passenger seat. She's like, I think you're going the wrong way. No, I'm not. I'm not going the wrong way. I'm like, I'm from here. I'm not going. To... She said, no, 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 listen. All the cars are going this way. And at that moment, I realized I was going the wrong way. Now, if you go the wrong way, what do you do? What do you do? You have two choices. You could be a man and just go for it, right? <laughs> I'm going for it. Which in that case... My wife, the voice of reason, said, you need to stop the car, park, turn around, back up, turn around, and go the, the right way. Now, here's the challenge. Some of you, it's funny to do that in the car. Some of you in here are that way with sin. Like, like you know you're going the wrong way. You see, you see the direction of God going, this, you see the commands of God saying, go this way, and you blindly, carelessly go the wrong way. And you know it's the wrong way, but you keep going the wrong way. Look at me closely. If you're going the wrong way today, listen to me. Pull over and park, turn around, and go the right way. And, and the wrong way can be a lot of things. Like maybe some of you just connected with an old girlfriend or boyfriend on Facebook that you hadn't seen in a long time. Stop, pull over and park, turn around. Uh, maybe some of you are, are doing some things in your business that may not be above board and they're shady. Nobody's gonna find out. <laughs> Nobody's gonna find this out. But you know it and God knows it. You need to stop, pull over, and, and go the right way. Some of you are, are battling an addiction. Just an overwhelming addiction. And you know it's wrong and no one knows, and you're, you're battling it. Pull over and park, stop, and go the right way. That's what I would say today. When you know you're in sin, the greatest thing you can do is at that moment, stop, turn around, and go the right way. See, Samson realized he was always at the wrong place, going the wrong way, at the wrong time, doing the wrong things. But secondly, we see, not only does he disrespect his parents, he disregards the command of God, or the commands of God. He disregards the commands of God. Samson is disrespecting God by eating from a dead carcass. But what's mind-blowing, you go back and study this later, is that he offers the honey from the dead carcass to who? Did you catch that? His parents. <laughs> Misery loves company, right? So I'm gonna defile myself so I have no disregard for my own life, then I'm gonna just have mom and dad join in as well. Now you have to think about this. Why didn't, and I thought about this this week, 
Why didn't he tell his parents that he was, uh, that he killed the lion and that he was eating from the carcass of the lion, particularly the killing of the lion? Why is he not telling his parents that? You ever thought about that? Like, cause you could justify, you're never gonna believe this cause I'm telling everybody that story, right? The day I tore a lion in two, right? I mean, I'm just telling everybody, I don't believe it. No, I'm telling you it happened. He doesn't tell anybody. And here's the reason he doesn't tell his parents, two reasons. Number one is this, the moment he kills the lion, what happens? He touches a dead body, disqualification. But the second reason, and we missed this with casual reading, look at verse five, go back up to verse five. Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the what? Vineyards of Timnah. So he's touching a dead body, hanging around in a vineyard. Warren Wearsby said this, when Samson ate the honey, watch this, from the lion's carcass, he was defiled by a dead body. And that part of the Nazarite dedication was destroyed. In fact, two thirds of his vow was now gone. He had defiled himself by going into the vineyard and by eating food from a dead body. Now here's Samson's problem. He's got a lot of problems, challenges, but Samson's like us. Here's his challenge. He was too prideful. See, Samson has gotten to the place now in his life where he has forgotten that his strength comes from God and not his own. And so he's prideful. What does he do? He taunts the Philistines. L listen, by him telling a riddle, he's saying, I'm smarter than you. I'm so, not only am I uh, more athletic than you, but I'm more intellectual than you. And so he's trying to play games with them. Samson starts taunting them. The, the, the wife at that time is starting to come to him and say, hey, listen, somebody's calling me right now. I don't need to answer that. <laughs> but anyway, so, on my iPad. But anyway, <laughs> I'm like, where are my notes at? Okay, uh, so Samson is taunting. Then he decides, because he's kind of falling apart here and he's getting mad at, at his wife who turns, uh, her, turns him into the Philistines, he gets furious, takes matters in his own hands. He goes out and kills how many people? Look at it. 30 people he goes out and kills with his bare hands. Then he goes back and takes the jawbone of a donkey. King James has another word we won't use here. The jawbone of a donkey, and he kills a 1,000 people. And then it escalates. This is a man out of his mind. Why not go for it all? Look what happens in chapter 15, verse 5. Notice the downward progression of Samson. <laughs> so he went out and caught 300 foxes. I don't know about you. How in the world do you catch 300 foxes, right? I'm trying to catch one rabbit that keeps eating my garden at home. I can't figure out how to catch the rabbit. 300 foxes, okay. He took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail, and put a torch between each pair of tails. Then he ignited the torches. I mean, these are running Roman bottle rockets here. Ignited the torches, released the foxes into the grain of the Philistines. He burned the piles of the grain and the standing grain as well as the vineyards and the olive groves. Here's the, here's the point. Up to this point in the life of Samson, Samson has used God's power for his own personal pleasure. See, for Samson, God's power is a toy to be played with. Samson up to this point has not helped anybody. He's not protected anybody. He's not prospered because of, he's not helped the nation prosper. It's all about Samson and all the, the, the cultural things that the world wants Samson to be. And what we're about to see is the great philosopher of the 90s, Bon Jovi said, Samson the son is about to go down in a blaze of glory, right? So anyway, I know that would win. Colin said, get rid of that joke. I love that joke because he's about to go down ship. And here's what we see. Not only did Samson disrespect his parents, not only did Samson disregard the commands of God, finally, he discarded his calling. And this is where we're gonna close. Because this is where we all are, right? Samson discarded his calling. After a failed attempt at marriage, he sets his eyes on prostitutes. In the story, when we get to chapter 16, this is the third woman in Samson's life and he has one failed relationship after another. Just a side note here. Those of you in here who think that you're gonna find satisfaction and pleasure and fulfillment when you just find the right person, uh, you're in for a rude awakening. Why? Because God wants you to find satisfaction and sustenance and joy in him 
and then he brings you a person to journey together in that joy toward him. And Samson realizes it's one failed attempt at a relationship after another. But Delilah's interesting, why? Because in Hebrew, we miss this, if we don't know it in English. Samson means sun or brightness or shining. Guess what Delilah means in Hebrew? Darkness. Did you know that? So Delilah means darkness, it means night. Um, and so what we see is the night Delilah is about to hide the brightness or the sun from shining. And Delilah repeatedly is wearing him down, seducing him to order to find out, tell me where your strength comes from. Tell me where your strength comes from. And again, Samson's flaunting and he thinks his power is his. And so finally, after a couple failed attempts, he says, the power is in my what? My hair. And what we see in this text is here's a man who could take ropes and break them with his bare strength. Here's a man who can rip a lion in two. Here's a man who can wrestle goats and bear. I mean, this is a man who could take out 3,000 people or 1,000 men at one time, but he can't withstand a woman. Wearing him down, nagging him, staying on him. She basically seduces him. He gives in to the temptation. And here's what happens. The Philistines come in. They lock him up with chains Samson tries to break free, he can't. They take him into captivity, and the very thing they do is a picture of Sam Samson's systemic problem. Don't miss this. What do they do to Samson, physically? They gouge his eyes out. And I think, don't miss this. I think what God's saying is this. The very thing that got him in trouble is the thing I'm gonna remove from him. You know what Samson shows us? Samson shows us today that nobody in here can play with temptation. Like, like when temptation arises in our life, we don't linger with temptation. Why? It always takes us closer and closer to the edge until it kind of brings us over the edge. And Samson's problem, I think, was this. Samson started to believe his own press clippings. Samson started to read the stories about his, his life and started to, Samson started to believe the positive Twitter and Facebook and Instagram comments about himself. And he thought that the reason he's so successful is because of him. And he forgot that the strength that he had was given from God. And so even when they, even when they cut his hair, this is fascinating. When they cut his hair, he doesn't say, up, oh, I'm done. What does he do? He tries to break free, like he still thinks he can get out of it. And it shows us this. Some people, sadly, are too successful for your own good. Some of you, look at me. Some of you in here, you've gotten too successful. Like you, sadly, at times, are thinking that it's all about you. And some people in here, with all due respect, listen to me, you've forgotten where you came from. I remember hearing this, I've never forgotten this, but um, when one of the major television preachers fell years ago, um, a guy told me he was on staff with Dr. Adrian Rogers and he went to Dr. Rogers and he said, hey, what's, what's wrong with all these guys? Why are they falling? Why is this guy falling? And Dr. Rogers, and the only way Dr. Rogers from Bellevue could say, he said, son, sometimes you just have to mow your own grass. What does that mean? Sometimes you have to just cut your own, you're not bigger than cutting your own grass. And what he meant is you need to remember where you came from. Just because you have a position, just because you have a business, just because you're a father or a mother or, or you're successful in life, you sometimes, it's easy for us to forget where we came from. Samson forgot the only reason he's where he is is because of who? Is because of God. And here's what he shows us. Don't, don't miss this, write this down. Unconfessed sin in your life and my life will destroy us. Unconfessed sin in our life. You don't play with sin. I mean, here's the thing. Nobody sets out to ruin their family, right? Like nobody says, I'm gonna marry my wife, I do on stage, but 25 years later, I'm gonna cheat on my wife, I'm gonna ruin my family, I'm gonna be the eyesore of my kids and I'm not gonna be there for my, 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 my kids when they go. Nobody says that but it happens. Nobody says, I'm gonna embezzle money, I'm gonna start my business, I'm gonna embezzle money, I'm gonna take advantage of people, I'm gonna uh, commit wire fraud, and then I'm going to prison for a couple. Nobody says that, but it happens. Here's what the Bible says. Abstain, I love this, abstain from any hint 
of immorality. Samson shows us two things I want us to get as, as we close, two walking points. Number one is this. Let us stop doing man's will and let us start doing God's will. Amen? And, and there's some people here that need to hear this. Let us stop doing man's will and let us start doing God's will. The problem with Samson, if you boil it down, he, was, he bent and he acquiesced to the cultural, political views of his day and himself. So he wasn't pleasing God, he was pleasing his flesh with women and partying and get together. He wasn't pleasing his parents who were giving him the commands of God, he was hiding it and living isolated and alone. And he started to flaunt his power. He wanted to prove and he wanted to be prideful around people. He was trying to be someone in the world's eyes and I feel like Samson, you ready for this? Never understood who God made him to be. A man with so much power, so much potential, but he wasted his whole life in a sense because he never was able to do and be the person God's called him to be. Here's why, because he, because he was acquiescing to the cultural norms of the world. He was being what someone else wanted him to be. I don't normally get these anymore, which I wanted to share this one because I think it's kind of comical, but I normally don't get anonymous emails like I used to. I used to get a lot of them uh, when I first got here. Uh, but I don't get any more. But I, got, I, I get, what do we get, Dylan? About once a week, we get, we get some of these. But I thought this was funny. I thought this would be one to share uh, with the church. So I'm gonna show you this email. Just got this one literally this week. Uh, and this, you can see the top, it says, Dear Pastor. And it says, uh, and I just kind of got to the, to the heart of it. Dear Pastor, the point of this letter may not pertain to you directly. However, if it doesn't, please share it with those pastors you know to whom it is pertinent. Please reconsider dressing casually to administer your sermons. Dressing down doesn't represent the power, authority, holiness, and esteem due to Christ our Lord. If you were an executive, you'd not dress casually, thus doing so to preach is disrespectful in its own right. Dressing as though you're going golfing, shopping, skating. I didn't know pastors skated. <laughs> going to visit friends, going to get to a get together or a party is inappropriate for a pastor preaching on Sunday and or doing church work. Please, my favorite line, wear suits to preach. It isn't humble to wear casual clothes to preach, it's arrogant to not respect God with professional attire. So, here we go, here we go, here we go. I want you to check this box off the list for those who say the pastor at Long Hollow never wears a coat and tie, here it is, okay? Here, here, here it is. Now, here's the thing. Uh, the first thing we know is that this person obviously does not go to Long Hollow. This is a random letter. Uh, and the reason we know he does not or she does not go to Long Hollow is, Brother David stopped wearing suits in uh, 2002, okay? So that, that's, but, but here's the thing about suits, and, and whether you wear jackets or suits or coats and ties, the cool thing about Long Hollow is you can come any way you want here. We, I mean, that's what we love about our church. You can dress any way you want, uh, and, and you can wear anything you want. Now, here's the funny thing. If we really want to be biblical, really, I wouldn't be up here with a, a jacket and tie. I'd be up here with a long robe and sandals. Let's just be honest, which may be offensive. But the funny thing about it is, if I listen to this letter and start wearing suits, then next week I'm gonna get another letter from somebody saying, why are you not wearing Hawaiian shirts and shorts, right? And so, and I think the root of the letter shows us something. It really has nothing to do with the attire. It has everything to do with what people want. The second reason, this is the main reason I stopped wearing suits years ago, and it's not that I don't like suits. The reality is I never wanna be a distraction from people here thinking they can't be like me or, or follow the Lord like me. I don't want people ever thinking, man, he's holier than thou. He's bigger than us, he's separated. I want people to look at me and say, man, if God can use a former drug addict, alcoholic who's destroyed his life and he can use Robbie, then golly, he can use me. Right? I don't want people ever think, man, he's better than me. I want people to look at me and say, wow. And if you knew me before, you would think that's a big deal. Uh, but the reality is this. It just shows us, sadly, here's what I thought about this week. How often, don't miss this, do you and I orient our lives based on the popular opinions of our culture? And we're so worried about posting the right pictures or looking a certain way. And, and young people in school, we have to dress a certain way. You have to respond a certain way. You have to look a certain, your hair's gonna be, you gotta be a certain kind of weight. You gotta fit in this mold of what perfection is. And here's what I wanna show you. 
Let's get rid of this mindset in the church that you have to be the greatest at anything, okay? I want you to get this. Meditate on this this week. I don't want you to think anymore. I gotta be the greatest because that's not what Jesus said. Jesus never said, be the greatest at anything. In fact, Jesus said, there's only one who's the greatest, it's me. And it's so freeing because we don't have to be him because he already was the greatest. Now, I'm not saying we, we're lazy and we're, and, and, and we're lackadaisical and we don't work hard and we don't strive for excellence. I'm not saying any of that. But what I'm saying is this, don't think, ladies, that you have to be the greatest mom. And if you're not the greatest mom, then you fail. Or you gotta be the greatest salesman or the greatest boss or the greatest filmmaker or the greatest uh, entrepreneur or, or, or the greatest audio engine, whatever, the greatest song, I gotta be the greatest at this or I gotta have the greatest amount of likes on Facebook or the greatest amount of Facebook followers. The cool thing about Jesus is he frees us from all that because you gotta remember from the world standards, Jesus was not the greatest. The Pharisees hated him. The religious leaders laughed at him. The high priest mocked him like, you're the Messiah, come on. By the world standards, you're a nobody. But isn't it interesting that Jesus is the greatest so we don't have to be? See, the invitation to follow Jesus is simple. He says, you don't have to be the greatest by the world standards. You wanna be great in the kingdom of God? Look at me. This is greatness in the kingdom of God. You become the person God's called you to be and you obey what God's leading you to do, and that's greatness in the kingdom. See, here's what we have to understand. Faithfulness always precedes fruitfulness. God produces fruit in our life. He calls you to be faithful. And so faithfulness always leads us to fruitfulness. Here's what I wanna tell you, you be you. God, out of his infinite wisdom, created one person on planet Earth, uniquely talented and gifted, it's you. There's never been a person like you before. There's never gonna be a person after you. Somebody's saying thank God. But anyway, there's never anybody like you. But here's the thing. God created you to be you. If you keep trying to be someone else, you're not being true to yourself. You want me to be me, and God wants you to be you. And that's glorifying to the Lord. Amen? Number two. You should consider getting in a discipleship group to guard your soul. We call them D groups here at Long Hollow. You should consider getting in a D group to guard your soul. And I know what you're thinking. I've been here for three and a half years and you will not stop talking about discipleship. Anybody with me? We're talking about it until you get in the group. Like like we're talking to you, like you who are not in D group. We want you to get in the group. And here's the thing why this is important. And we see it in the life of Samson. Samson's downfall was women. That might not be your downfall, but his downfall was women. It was a marriage that failed. It was a prostitute, chapter 16, verse one. It was Delilah nagging and overbearing and and, and conniving in his life. And so his problem, you have to believe, was his eyes. Because he would see something delightful and he would go after it. He would see a woman and think it would satisfy or fulfill him. Now that's biblical precedent for that, why? Because in the garden, Eve sinned because of what? She saw the fruit was good to eat and delightful, and she took it. Remember Achan, when he sinned against God, God said, don't take any of the spoils. He looked at it and took it, and he sinned. Remember David and Bathsheba, David's on the roof, what happens? He looks with his eyes and he sees. I don't think it's any accident that the physical punishment that God allows the Philistines to perform on Samson is to gouge out his eyes. I think what he's showing us is this. You and I may never gouge out our eyes physically, but some of you need to take drastic measures to eradicate sin through your eyes spiritually. Right? Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, and I think he had this in mind when he was when he was speaking this, he said, if your eye causes you to sin, what? Remember this? Gouge it out. For it's better for you to lose one of the members of your body than for your whole body to enter into hell. Let me give you how this, let me me show you like two practical ways this works. So this past year in my discipleship group, one of my guys came in, he was in our group, and he had his cell phone there and he said, hey guys, he's like, man, I've got a problem with one of my news apps. He's like, the news app keeps bringing up women's advertisement of skimpy outfits. So every time I'm trying to read the news, this kind of pops up. And so we said, you know what you need to do. And right there, what did we challenge him to do? 
right there. Delete the news app, why? Because we said, what's more important? You keeping up to date with news or you preserving your soul for eternity? That's what's at stake here. It's not, well, it's just a cell phone. No, 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 way bigger than that. Because here, here's how it works, right? It's so subtle that you don't even realize it's happening. Ladies, here's what happens. You're up at night, your husband's in bed next to you, you're up at night, and you're scrolling through Facebook. As you're scrolling through Facebook, you see an old boyfriend you dated 20, 25 years ago. And you think to yourself, wow, I wonder what so-and-so's, I hadn't seen or heard from him in a long time. Let me just catch up. And the text is, is uh, inconspicuous and just so you think there's nothing wrong with this. Text. Hey, you, comma, that's the Hey, you, hadn't seen you in a while. How's life? Question mark, sin. And then he responds back and says, wow, I never thought about you till now. And then what happens is you start this instant message conversation on Facebook. But here's how, how it works. It always leads you further than you wanna go. Why? Because you start saying, why are we talking on Facebook? I do better on the phone. Here's my cell phone, would you just call me when you have a free time? And then what happens, ladies, is you start talking to him on your lunch break at the office, and so now it's become, and you realize, you know, the phone just ain't gonna do it. You wanna see in person, and it just so happens he's coming through town, and so, hey, doing anything for lunch? I'll meet up for lunch. So you go to some place outside of town where you can meet for lunch, and then you start to realize at the lunch table, you have already developed an emotional affair with a person who's not your husband. And then you say, hey, you know, no one's home at the house. You wanna come back and just hang. And it always takes you further than you wanna go. And then you realize three or four months into this emotional affair, which eventually became a physical affair, you realize that he's now convinced you to leave your husband, who you've been married to for 15 years, and your three kids, two of which are twins, for this man. You know how I know that story? Because that just happened to a good friend of mine at my former church. How'd it start? It started with a simple, subtle, inconspicuous text through Facebook from an old boyfriend. That's how it happens. And so I want us to think in our life, what, what, what are the things that are gonna cause us to fall? What are the things that we need to gouge out and get rid of? See, Samson's problem is he had no one speaking into his life. He had no one holy. Samson was a loner. Samson was a lone ranger, if we'd have today's terms, Christian. Man, I could, do, I could do this Christian thing. I don't need a church, man. I don't need a life group, golly. And here's what happens. You've convinced yourself as a married couple. Here's what happens. I meet a lot of couples. You've convinced yourself, we've made it for 15 years without a life group. Why do we need one now? And your marriage is falling apart. <laughs> Why would I need a D group? I mean, I'm, I'm made up to this point. See, that's what the discipleship group offers. It offers accountability. It offers edification. It offers someone who's gonna keep you from going off the rails if you head that way. Like, who do you have in your life holding you accountable now? Think about this. Guys, who do you have in your life who's gonna say, hey man, I know you don't think this is an issue, but it is. I mean, that's why it's called a blind spot. If you knew it was a, was a spot or a problem in your life, it'd be called a visible spot. It's called a blind spot because you can't see it. Now, I know what you may be thinking. Okay, pastor, who's holding you accountable? Well, that's a good question. Like, like do you, you're telling us to do this, but do you have like safeguards in your life? This is a great question, and people have asked me this before. I learned a long time ago, I'm not the only one who hears from God in this church, by the way. Like you hear from God, our staff hears from, I'm not the only holy man in this church, okay? Uh, there's other people who hear from God, and many of you as well are following the Lord and can speak life and I realized God's assembled a team around me. And I realized God has gifted me with some things and there's a lot of things I'm not good at. And I recognize that. But I have a team of guys called a lead team. I implemented this eight years ago. And these guys have journeyed with, you probably say, well, these are a bunch of yes men, you pay them. No, these guys know because I welcome feedback that I need them to hold me accountable. And it's not just, hey, are you reading your Bible and memorizing scripture? Robbie, are you loving your wife as Christ loved the church? Pastor, how well are you discipling your kids? Pastor, are you looking at anything that would be displeasing to the Lord or run Christ's name through the mud or jeopardize your marriage? I have guys that speak into my life and some of these guys I've been with for 11 years. Colin Wood and I have been together for 11 years. 
And I know he, he has the best in mind for, and I do the same for them. I'm holding them accountable. Here's why I, I, I need that and you need that. Here's why. A, que- a leader who can't be questioned is a questionable leader. Right, write that down. A leader who can't be questioned is a questionable leader. A Christian who can't be questioned is a questionable Christian. A man who can't be questioned, you need, well, that's all. But anyway, you know the point. If you can't be questioned and critiqued with love and people speak in your life, then you need to repent of that. Because who's gonna call it out when we don't see it? Listen, we all need that. And that's what a discipleship group does for you. Edification, uh, transparency, intimacy, confidentiality, uh, replication. Scripture memory, loving your spouse. I mean, you get all of that. So what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Somebody said, I've been in the D group, but I haven't started one, I've been in one now. God's calling you to lead one right now. So I want you to pray about that. As our ushers come forward, I wanna pray over that. And then I'm gonna have our ushers take up our offering. And I want you to be thinking how you can respond that way.